Good morning, uh, and can I welcome members of the press and public to the 12th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015. Uh, can I ask all those present to ensure that electronic items are switched to flight mode uh, so that they don't affect the work of the committee? Uh, Nigel Dawn uh, has conveyed his apologies for today's meeting and would like to welcome Sandra White, who is his substitute today. Uh, can I move to agenda item number one, colleagues, and that is that we take Agenda item numbers 6, 7, 8 and 9 in private. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. We move to agenda item number 2, which is the Section 23 report, Scotland's Colleges 2015. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our panel of witnesses. Uh, firstly, Aileen McKechnie, Director of Advanced Learning and Science in the Scottish Government. I'd like to make, welcome Michael Cross, the Deputy Director of Colleges and Adult Learning Division, Scottish Government. Uh, Lawrence Hills, uh, who is the Chief Executive of the Scottish Funding Council, and John Kemp, the Director of Access, Skills and Outcome Agreements for the Scottish Funding Council. Uh, you're welcome. I understand that both Ill McKechnie and Lawrence Hills have to make a very short statement. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to provide evidence to this committee in response to the Auditor General's report on colleges. As with previous reports, we found it helpful. We were pleased that the report identified that college finances are sound, that planning for mergers was good, and that the sector has responded well to a period of significant change. The report equally identified some areas for improvement, and we're currently taking forward action in relation to all the recommendations that Audit Scotland has directed to the Scottish Government. I'm here on behalf of the Director General for Learning and Justice, who's the relevant accountable officer for the Scottish Government. Lawrence Howells, to my left, is the accountable officer at the Scottish Funding Council. And I'll take a moment, if I may, to outline our different but complementary roles. The Director, Learning, the Director General for Learning and Justice is responsible for ensuring that the Funding Council's strategy and delivery aligns with the priorities of the Scottish Government, that it has the necessary controls in place to safeguard public funds. The Funding Council is accountable for delivery of Scottish Government policy objectives, the deployment of resources to that end, and for all associated planning and risk management. Convener, this September will mark the fourth anniversary of the publication of Putting Learners at the Centre, which kick-started our post-16 education reform. The guiding principle of our reform agenda has always been about putting learners at the very centre. Colleges have since implemented the most profound set of reforms in Scottish tertiary education for more than a generation designed to improve the sector's efficiency and effectiveness, to improve learner outcomes, and to strengthen accountability. So we now have a re regionalised sector with 13 regions and a reduction from 42 colleges to 15. The college reform agenda has allowed for more strategic planning of provision aligned with economic need, has improved the life chances of young people, and is generating the skilled workforce needed for growth. The reform agenda has created a sector that is more flexible and responsive, better able to meet the needs of students and of industry, better positioned to respond to the expectations of this government around increasing participation, <coughs> prosperity and fairness. Colleges are now delivering greater levels of activity for less resource and with greater impact. That surely is a definition of good public service reform, especially in the current economic context. However, we have always acknowledged, and I do so again, that a reform programme of this scale and pace has been and remains challenging. Audit Scotland's report has helpfully captured areas of improvement for our continued attention, and we are grateful for that. We recognise that there is more to do, and we look forward to continuing to support the sector into the next phase. Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to take questions along with my colleagues. Thank you. What else? Thank you, yes. I just wanted to illustrate a few of the points that, that Aileen's highlighted uh, um, in her remarks. Um, uh, the, this is a programme of unprecedented reform in both structures and how the college sector is funded through outcome agreements. Um, and as we know, there have been concerns over, over many years about the number of small colleges in Scotland and, and the programme of mergers, uh, which was initiated in 2011, you know, has, has dealt with that issue. And as the Auditor General's report shows, on the whole, has been managed well and has delivered a more efficient and effective sector. Um, one of the key benefits of the new uh, regional colleges is we now have larger, more efficient colleges able to engage strategically with their region and better uh, provide provision which meets the needs of students, their communities and employers. And just three examples of that. For example, in Ayrshire, um, the new Ayrshire College covering the, the whole region of Ayrshire um, has enabled, been able to enhance its partnership with CPPs 
Uh, and that has led to, for example, the establishment of a skills centre of excellence in Irving, at Irving Royal Academy, which is a shared campus development between the school and the college, a very good example of, of how the two sectors can join together. In the case of Edinburgh, um, uh, Edinburgh, College's, Edinburgh College's new STEM Academy, Science, Technology and Engineering Academy, will recruit its first cohort of students in 2015-16, and that will create a partnership, um, a partnership to create a curriculum between the college, between employers, between the local authority and between Edinburgh Napier University, and that will transform education in the, in the science, technology and engineering subjects. And finally, my final example from West College, uh, Scotland, uh, where they report um, annual savings of just under £6 million per year from the, me from the merger, with the majority of those savings com coming from salaries, uh, with further savings from VAT, subscriptions, licence agreements, insurance and printing. So those three examples show how the new regional colleges are more efficient, how they're able to engage with their regions and how they're able to enhance the provision for both learners and for employers. Um, and, and I look forward to um, answering questions from the committee. Thank you. Uh, Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Can I just first of all ask about the, the regional boards? We've got 10 colleges that manage very well uh, without a regional board, and I would actually argue that they are much more autonomous, they can react much more easily and uh, in terms of reflecting their local needs. Uh, the Audit General's report, paragraph 36, introducing regional bodies has resulted in a complex framework of accountability and... Uh, Individual colleges have expressed concerns that regional bodies will affect their autonomy. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I can guarantee that many of the colleges in the UHI network do feel the heavy hand of an extra layer of bureaucracy. Is a regional board really necessary? It's costly, it's bureaucratic, it's time-consuming, it takes away autonomy, and 10 colleges man manage very well without it. Is it something we should be looking at uh, abolishing? Thank you for thank you for that question. Sorry. I'll look to the um, yes, Ian McKay. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, I, th I think the funding council will equally have um, some comments to make in relation to the regional structure. Um, we believe that um, where we have regional structures in place, which is in three spaces, um, where there are multi-college regions, um, and I assume that you're referring to the multi-college regional structure, um, which is in UHI and Glasgow and Lanarkshire. Um, so we have introduced that structure there because we believe that provides greater accountability um, because one body then at that regional level can be held to account for the region's outcome agreement with the funding council. We equally believe that will deliver improved outcomes um, because the, the regional body can plan and fund in the best interests of students and employers across the entirety of the region. You heard what I was saying but you say it's greater accountability. My question was that the Auditor General has brought to this committee her concerns that this has resulted in a complex framework of accountability. So is she wrong? Is it more complex? Is it more bureaucratic? Or well, I'm, is so it I'm, better? I'm seeking to answer. So in our view, we believe that it provides greater accountability and it provides um, a, an easier route in to engagement um, with, you know, as, as if I take the Glasgow structure, for example, having a single regional board that engages with the universities, with the government, with the funding council, with employers, um, with the city council, that um, simplifies the engagement route um, where previously um, all of those institutions have had to engage with 10 colleges before, before the mergers. Um, they, would have, they would have to engage with three separate institutions um, if, we had, if we didn't have the regional structure in place. Um, we look to them, and clearly we are in a moment of transition in terms of the regional structures because they are not yet fully embedded. Um, they are not yet functioning fundable bodies um, in relation to two of them specifically. We expect the regional bodies to understand the level of volume, the demographics, the market needs, the economic needs, and to help deliver an improved service both to learners and to local economies. So that's our ambition across the regional structure. I think it's too early to say 
um, you know, to use the language that you had used, Ms. Scannon, about them being, you know, costly and bureaucratic. I don't think they are in terms of cost um, thus far. Um, we expect them to cost less than 0.5% of the budgets for which they will be responsible in due course. So, in our view, that's not that's not particularly costly. We expect the value add that they will provide to be beneficial, as I say, to learners and to the local economy, um, and that's our ambition. But it's a, you know we're on a journey in terms of their establishment and their embedding and their ability to deliver. Yeah, but I hear what you say, but as a Highlands and Islands MSP, you're talking about the accountability between the government and the regional board. I'm talking about the accountability of a local college and its community. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, it may be easier for civil servants to talk to fewer people. I'm actually talking about the grassroots accountability of a local college in Orkney, Shetland, Western Isles or Thurso responding to the needs of that, accountable to the local business and industrial and commercial needs of that community. That's very different to your accountability. Well, so I hear what you're saying. Um, clearly, there are college boards in each of the individual colleges, which are very close to the, the local community and the local economy. The chairs of those boards will all sit on the regional board um, alongside the principals and influence the thinking um, and identify synergies and opportunities across the piece. And that's part of the ambition of, of the regional structure. I think Lawrence would like to say something about the UHI structure or John. I think the, the accountability to, to local employers, to local people, um, through the, the local college will continue. Um, but what, what will change is that instead of that local college having a direct relationship with the funding council in Edinburgh, it will have a direct rela more direct relationship um, with a body within the Highlands. Um, now, Michael Foxley, the, 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 the regional chair um, for the, the Highlands, um, was at, at this committee just a few weeks ago, um, and I think he said at that that he was a, you know, a fierce defender of the autonomy of colleges um, you know, within the UHI, um, and certainly in our experience, you know, that is something you know, he has demonstrated, and exactly the kind of local accountability that you've talked about is something that I think that the, the chair of the regional board in the Highlands would support. Well, I'll, I'll leave it there, but the Auditor General has expressed concerns and I've heard serious concerns. So can I move on, convener, to uh, Ms McKechnie. You said that um, you're looking to align the priorities of Scottish Government uh, with the colleges, so you're aligning the priorities of the Scottish Government, uh, Scottish colleges, uh, in line with Government priorities. Uh, now, we're looking at another report this morning on uh, ICT and the problems in the government sector uh, with the lack of ICT staff. So have you been making sure that uh, student numbers in colleges are sufficient? Um, we've got sufficient graduates and experienced ICT personnel to ensure that uh, all the jobs in Scotland uh, are filled. I know it's a government priority. Is that something you've been looking at? Indeed. I, mean, I will look to the Funding Council to provide, uh, to provide more detail on this, but clearly we look at the ICT and the digital agenda and, and see that as of, you know, of significant importance to the Scottish economy going forward. Um, there is you know, a great deal of work and activity taking place in relation to understanding the needs of industry. Um, and delivering against those needs through the skills provision that we provide through colleges um, and our universities, because some of these skills are, are specialist and high level and, and will be delivered through um, through some of our, you know, our, our particular institutions like Abertee, for example, which Abertee University provides some um, very specific um, defence-related skills in, in the ICT space. Um, we are equally working with Skills Development Scotland just now in relation to the establishment of a digital skills academy. Um, so there's a, a, you know, a whole range of activity going on to ensure that we understand the needs of industry and that uh, we seek to deliver them. But I'm so sure the, the so if, could provide if more you're detail. doing so much work in colleges, it's colleges we're looking at sure. today, if you're aligning the college sector and the college numbers with I, uh, with the, the government priorities, why is there 25, over 25,000 fewer places on ICT courses in colleges in the last few years contributing to the national shortage uh, of ICT personnel that we're about to look at? So if you're doing this significant piece of work aligning to the government priorities, why have you allowed 25,000 places to fall? I look to the funding council to 
provide a response on the detail of that, but what I would say in terms of, of the numbers um, of, of courses reduced, we've looked to reduce um, those courses that we felt didn't deliver um, a, you know, an economically valuable output. So we have looked to reduce the shorter courses that were five hours or less, and that might have been um, courses that were, you know, um, you know kind of basic IT skills, which we find that, that you know, individuals need less now because ICT is taught from preschool right the way through the school system. So the demand that might have been there a decade ago for the very basic ICT skills is no longer there because most people have the basic skills. Well, I got the information from SPICE. It's computer technology, computer science, programming systems, computer use, software and operating systems, text, graphics, multimedia, software for specific applications. It's not like a, a two-hour night class or anything. You know, these are, and this is further and higher education um, within the FE sector, a fall of 25,000 places. We brought together um, employers from the IT sector and colleges and universities um, just I think about six weeks ago, um, for a forum on, on the skills that were needed in, in ICT. And there has been a drop in demand um, for courses at both college and university level in ICT. There is a mismatch between the skills that people are learning in college and university and what the industry needs, and there has been a drop um, in computing in schools as well. And all of these things are part of a, a complex mix of trying to get a match between um, what has been produced by schools, colleges and universities and the industry need. And now, Aileen's talked about you know, part of the solution to that being a, a digital talent academy, which SDS are developing. We are also, as a result of the forum um, we had um, just uh, six weeks ago, looking at ways that we can better link what colleges and universities are doing with what employers need. Because yes, it is partly about the numbers on courses, but it's also about getting people the right skills on these courses so that they flow into work. And one of the issues that we heard from employers was that some of the people who were on these courses were not, didn't have the skills they needed. There was some frustration in the colleges and universities that they were producing people with what they thought were the right skills and they weren't getting jobs. So we need to get that match right as well as getting the numbers right. And we do accept there is a gap um, in the, you know, the number of people with computing skills flowing through both colleges and universities. My figures were HNC, HND and graduates, but yeah. we'll leave it there. Yeah. We do. Thank you, Mina. Um, I'd like to explore a little bit about... Uh, arm's length foundations offs and this may be well be a question for the for the SFC. Um, originally the colleges in 2013-14 transferred 90, about 99 million into ALFs. Is it anticipated that there'll be transfers every year? And if so, do you consider it likely that there'll be a mixture of both private and public money being backed into these ALFs? <laughs> Respond to that one. Um, the 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 ALFs are, uh, are set up to enable the colleges to mitigate the effects, uh, the impact of ONS on their uh, reserves, and enable them to manage their money over a slightly longer term. Um, so uh, we expect colleges to use those uh, that mechanism to enable them to achieve that goal. Um, we don't expect them, their, every college, to be transferring money into, into ALFs every single year, though there will be transfers. For example, some of that to, to manage the effects of uh, a, a capital building project that maybe spans over more than one year or whatever. Um, a, a, and uh, we also expect that the, most of that, those transfers will be to enable them to manage um, you know, um, surpluses from commercial activity or whatever so that that can be used for, for longer term benefit. Um, from 2014, the total amounts in ALFs has been reduced by 11 million to, to 88 million, uh, uh, and that's a sign that some of those resources that were put into that, um, the, 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 the funds have been used for mostly capital projects that, that have been developing the sector. Um, uh, I suppose the, the, um, the issue about um, monitoring the, the inflows and outflows into, into the trust is very important, and we, of course, will be doing that with the colleges so that we understand uh, the pattern of, of, of transfers, both in and out, and we will be keeping under review how effective the ALFs have been in, in delivering their objectives. I did, I did ask about whether it was uh, 
it was likely there would be both private and public money being backed into uh, ALF. The, 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 for example, public money might be uh, transferred into ALF if it's about managing the, the cash flow of a, of a building project over a period or, or something of that sort. And how are we going to sort of follow the public pound here? Because they're obviously, by the very name, they're arm's length. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do we how do we ensure that public money is properly spent? And I, I understand there's a, a small minority of the ALFs that have been set up are not specific to the college. They're, they're specific to further education, which could open up the possibility, theoretically, that the money could be spent elsewhere. The um the trusts were all set up um, uh, using a model, uh, and the, the, they're uh, governed by charity law and company law where that's appropriate. Uh, um, that means that the, the funding can only be used for the purposes for which they're provided. I'm, I'm actually not aware that there were colleges. Uh, I mean, my understanding is that all the trusts are specific to the specific colleges concerned, um, and that only those colleges or those, the, the, the benefit of further education in, in those regions can, can benefit from that. Um, I think it's important to say this is not a new, a totally new model, uh, the model of using trusts uh, to help um, public bodies manage uh, money over a longer period is, is, is well established and they are governed by charity law and the, and the constraints on that. So um, the money effectively can only be used to benefit further education and my understanding is to only benefit those regions. Can I be reassured that SFC will be responsible for ensuring that the public money going into ALFs is properly spent on the colleges that they're linked with? The, we will monitor what's happened, but they are governed by charity law uh, and company law. Um, so that is the legal framework under which they are, um, uh, you know, operate. But would you be aware if the funding was used for another purpose we will indeed we will indeed monitor what they're used for and we will be able to um, represent to show how that, mo that money is used and effectively that will be what money flows in and what money flows out and how is that used what would you do if you thought the money was being spent on something different uh, we would uh, we would be asking questions and we would be drawing the attention of the re relevant regulators do you think uh, the freedom of information act should apply to these foundations given the fact there's public funding in there? Um, I, that's not a matter I've got a, a view on. Do you have a view, Aileen? Um. The Scottish Funding Council wouldn't have a view. Sorry, I haven't, it's not a matter I've, I've considered, so I, I would so, want so, to think so about so that. Can we just confirm for the record, then, the Scottish Funding Council and any of the discussions about these arms-length companies and any of the board and various board meetings that you've held have never discussed the issue about complaints with FOI? Uh, not a question, uh, sorry. Uh, the question was, should FOI regulation, regulations apply to the trusts? Uh, well, so just to clarify, uh, yeah. though, you said that it's not something you've thought about. Am I yeah. correct in saying that? I haven't, I haven't considered how FOI and if FOI should yeah. apply yeah, to the trusts. I, I would want them to be open, of course, and I would yeah. want them to be, and they are open through. But just, to, uh, just to clarify then, so you've said it's not something you've thought about, but I'm asking is it something that your organisation have ever discussed in any of their... I, I'm not meetings. aware of us discussing that as part of creating the trusts. We, we, we helped the colleges build the trusts, building on the models that were provided to us by Turk and uh, Connell, the legal firm that helped to advise on that. So, so just to clarify, though, we'll, we'll come on to other questions when it's the, the committee wants to direct the, those questions. We will direct the questions. But just to clarify, mm. at no occasion of the Scottish Funding Council, when setting up these trusts, have they ever discussed the issue of FOI compliance? I'm, I'm not aware of us discussing that issue. OK. Uh, Scottish Government? Uh, sorry. Oh, I, wonder if I, but I wonder if I might just um, add to what Lawrence has said. Um, Lawrence mentioned that the Arms Length Foundation model isn't a new model. So the Arms Length Foundation model, um, as far as I'm aware, was first utilised for the Historic Scotland Foundation, which was established over 10 years ago. Um, and it has been you know, replicated and improved over the intervening period in the culture and heritage sector um, with the establishment of, of similar arm's length foundations for the national collections, for example. Um, so it's a long-standing, a relatively long-standing model um, that has existed in the public sector firmament to create um, the opportunity for bodies um, 
to manage their finances over you know, over a multi-year basis where it's appropriate to so do you for it you know, and, and the funding council mentioned the need to do that in relation to, to large-scale capital projects for example which will never be concluded in, in a single year so these foundations have been in existence for quite some time in the public sector firmament and have delivered um, you know quite significant yeah. opportunities so for ju 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 just to clarify when, when I think most of us probably know that uh, can we just clarify though in terms of FOI and the point Mr Beatty asked, uh, has that been a discussion that's taken place within your own department about compliance with that and I'm whether we should comply aware, with I'm it? I'm not aware that it has, um, that, that it's a discussion that has taken place, but I, as it, I suppose the point I was making is that they are, you know, these are not new models. If there was an well, issue about FOI yeah, compliance, yeah. I would be surprised that it hadn't been raised before. Sorry. I would, if, if there were, if there was an issue with F, with FOI compliance in relation to this type of model, because it's not a new one, I would be surprised that it hadn't been raised before with us. But I'm not aware that it's been that it's an issue that has been raised with the government. Okay. Just, so, so just one, to just one final question on the point of the FOI. Um, given the discussion we've had around the table at the moment, would you be considering looking at that aspect? I think, given the, you've, you raised it, we will commit to consider that aspect and discuss it with the, the, the relevant people. Yes. Thank you. Sure, on, on that issue. Yes. On that issue. Thank you, convener. Just a couple of quick points. Um, just, uh, Mr. Howells, uh, you just agreed to uh, to my, my colleague Colin Beatty's uh, question there, uh, and it was uh, suggested a few moments ago that the issue hadn't been raised. We, uh, at the last uh, committee, when this particular issue came up. I raised the issue of freedom of information, so that actually will be on the public record. So I would have assumed that, uh, that when, uh, when any research was being done before yourselves came to this committee, that that point would have been picked up. So, can I respond? Um, so you did raise it. Um, I think the question that was addressed to us was, has, you know, had this issue been considered um, by either the government or the Funding Council when we were establishing it? The, the ALF model, and as I say, as far as I'm aware, it hadn't at that time. Um, but absolutely, you know, subsequent to today's meeting, and you know, and, and clearly having, uh, you know, having seen the product of, of the previous meeting you had with the college principals um, and chairs on the 10th of June, we're aware that it's an issue that is concerning to the committee. So we will take it away um, and you know, and, and look into it further. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, final question, can you know, just it's the certainly the Mr. Howells and your comments uh, a short time ago uh, when you, you highlighted the point that it's not a, it's not a new model, uh, and uh, and also there are similar. Uh, models uh, in existence. And it was only very recently that this Parliament actually agreed to extend the FOI legislation to include leisure trusts. Uh, and the, that particular regulation went through the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Uh, I was a member of that committee at the time. Uh, and it's the, so in terms of uh, the colleges, uh, um, and also this particular issue we're discussing today, uh, I would argue that um, that precedence has already been set in terms of the extension of the FOI and in terms of the colleges, uh, there is uh, probably no real, uh, s no strong reason for the extension of FOI not to actually happen. And uh, I, I certainly would like um, a firm commitment from both uh, the SFC and uh, the Scottish Government to certainly go away and look at this particular issue uh, and certainly to provide written evidence back to the, or a written report or a response back to the committee at a future date. And we commit to do that. And same here. Yes. Yeah, could I just ask me, there's one point that was raised in the last evidence session with the college principals, where they responded by advising that the costs associated with responding to FY requests for the, for the trust might prohibit the the free flow of the responses to information because of the costs associated. Is that something that you think would possibly prevent us taking this forward? I, I, I think we need to look at the issue in the round. I wouldn't have thought that would be the principal reason for making a decision. I think the principal reason is the principle of kind of openness and uh, and the fact that it's part of uh, you know the, the public domain. So, so I would prefer to um, let, let's look at the issue. Let's make a commitment to look at the issue and, and as you as you request, provide written evidence on that on that basis. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and, and good morning. Uh, having looked at uh, the report from the Auditor-General, 
in general, if you pardon the pun, uh, the report seems to be quite positive, and it's obviously looking at monitoring what is going on. So the questions I wanted to ask is in regard to you know the staffing, how it affects staff and students. And I notice in the Audit General's report, it mentions the changes to date have had minimal negative impact on students. So I just want to know what your thoughts are from this funding council and obviously the government as well. Uh, if you are monitoring and what you have you know, found so far, uh, the impact on the changes of students and staff of the, the mergers. On, on the subject of students, I mean, the most basic measure of how well um, the, the colleges are serving the students is that the success rate um, for students in colleges has, has continued to go up throughout the reform period. There's been no interruption in that. So, I mean, at a, a very basic level of providing courses and getting people through it, um, you know, students are being served well um, through that. Also, as part of the, the post-merger evaluation of the colleges that have been merging, we have been speaking to groups of students um, about their experience of the merger as part of uh, our own evaluation. And by and large, that um, you know, feed it, uh, the, the feedback from the students has been very positive. Um, what we, we tend to find is that many students don't notice a huge amount of change during merger, which is a good thing. That you know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're still doing you know, the same courses in the same buildings, which is exactly what we want. One very positive benefit for students of the, the reform programme is that um, as part of making sure the mergers were well organised and were listening to students, we funded um, the the upgrading of students' associations within colleges, which had traditionally lagged behind what was possible in universities. Um, so in the merging colleges, we, we put some funding in so that there was you know, stronger student representation during the period in the merger, but we you know, hoped that some of that would carry on afterwards, and it has. We now have far stronger students' associations in colleges. Um, and by and large, the feedback we're getting from them about the, the reform programme is good. Um, across the, you know, the whole range of their experience in the colleges. Does Mbekeke want to come in on that one? Or? Um, I, I suppose I would just want to add that um, there is formal and informal measurement and evaluation of both the student experience and the staff experience, um, and that will be visible in, um, in publications like the Funding Council's College's Baseline Report, um, College's Performance Indicators, um, the Annual Learning for All reports, the Outcome Agreement reports, Education Scotland reviews, which take into account staff and student experience, staff surveys, student surveys, student satisfaction surveys, the UKCS skills survey um, with regard to employer satisfaction. There's a whole swathe of evidence that's provided um, and, and that equally there's qualitative engagement with staff and students that provides useful information in terms of temperature checking the impact because we were very conscious clearly that the the scale and pace of this reform agenda was significant mm. and you know we anticipated that there would be impact um, you know in, within the institutions um, and what we what we have found is that um, what was interesting was a TES article just last week where um, a student rep indicated that there had been you know for him in his college um, you know, little visibility of the change so it was business as usual from a student perspective mm -hmm. there was clearly a, there was clearly significant impact on staff particularly at senior level because they were managing quite a significant reform mm -hmm. and change agenda um, but you know from from our perspective because you know as, as you as you started as you said at the start of, of, of your intervention um, the the oldest Scotland report is is primarily positive about about the reform journey that we've been on so the the college leadership has delivered um successfully in relation to this this transformational journey that we've been on could, could i just <coughs> sorry thank you Chair. Uh, could i just continue on the theme of you know the students in the situation and obviously the audit scotland report mentions about the colleges continue to meet targets for learning and deliv delivering uh, around 76 million hours of learning uh, 2013 2014 uh, can i ask if you look, have you looked at um, obviously it's full time college places we're looking at, as that obviously fits into people, you know, basically getting jobs, skills based at the end of the day, and it has seemed to become a wee bit more difficult for over 25 to get part time college places. Have you monitored that? Have you asked students in regards to that how that affects the students as well? 
Can I, can I just say a few words and then, and then the Funding Council will want to come in with some of the detail. Um, clearly, we did, so the government absolutely articulated um, a direction of, of ambition for the college mm -hmm. sector, which, was, which changed quite, quite dramatically um, post, our, um, post our reform agenda. Um, we sought to deliver um, courses that led to economically valuable qualifications. So we were looking to um, move students through the college system and articulate them and help them articulate into further learning, um, training or education or into jobs. And that was, that was the ambition. Um, we focused equally um, on young people because ministers understood that um, from, from research that previous mm -hmm. recessions had impacted quite dramatically on young people. And ministers are un unapologetic about the, the drive to ensure that we didn't um, let a generation of young people down. And I think the, the, the youth employment statistics demonstrate that we have been successful in, in that ambition. So we have focus on full-time courses and qualifications. Mm -hmm. That is not to say there are no part-time courses and qualifications because that because there absolutely are and, and Lawrence will want to say something about increased investment in part-time courses um, in, the, in the past year um, amongst other things in relation to detail. <coughs> we a lot of the the change has been because we asked colleges to deprioritize um, very short courses, leisure courses, and and courses that didn't lead to a qualification, uh, and that's in line with the the delivering value, uh, delivering economic value to to individuals and to the nation. However, we we have uh, uh, colleges are still allowed and indeed encouraged to provide access courses which might fit into those categories. They might be very short or they might not lead to a qualification themselves, but their design is to help uh, people move from that kind of learning into more formal learning, which has more economic value and helps people to get into, in, into, into jobs. And that's the, that, that's the way that the, the government priority and the government focus on delivering value for people and communities and employers is, is translated. It is very important for, for, for colleges to try and make that best fit between the needs of their region and what they provide. And we ask them to work in partnership with other um, providers and other agencies within their region to do that, um, particularly, of course, through the CPP, so that, they, that we try and dovetail the provision that colleges provide with other providers uh, in their region and with, indeed, the third sector. So we try and get the best fit for that region. Um, <coughs> the big shift towards uh, more full-time applies uh, to older students as well as, as younger students, and there are, indeed, more older students taking full-time courses um, it, you know, uh, between the period 2008 and 2013-14. So, so I think that the big shift is what we've tried to do is reduce courses which are of less economic value both to individuals and to, and to the nation as a whole. Just your question, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, as someone who actually benefited from a access course and an older student, 33 when I went back to mm. further education, I'm pleased to say you mentioned access and it's very important, and not just to myself, but I think to everyone here, uh, that uh, people from deprived areas, regardless of age, are able to access further education. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any figures which shows that uh, people from the deprived areas, younger or older, are being encouraged and increasing to get into further education? Is there, is there any monitoring on that particular aspect? Do we have the figures up for it? Or? Yeah. That, that is one of the, the measures in our outcome agreements, is the proportion of students from the most deprived 10% of postcodes. Um, and the figures are that um, around 16% of the students in colleges are from the most deprived 10% of postcodes, which, you know, if, if all being equal, if, if there was a perfect distribution, you know, you'd get 10%. Um, so what that shows is that colleges um, are serving you know, the most deprived um, to a greater extent than you would expect if there was a perfect distribution. So, and that has been you know, going up. It's one of the, the measures in our outcome agreements. So we, we don't think that the, the, the reform has in any way impacted on the ability of colleges to serve the most deprived. And similarly, if you look at um, HE courses in colleges, um, the they are a major part of the widening access effort for HE courses across mm. Scotland. And, and, and again, the, um, the most deprived, we, we use 20% there rather than 10% as a measure, um, the, the most deprived are overrepresented in colleges compared to the distribution in the population. Uh, to, 
So I did. I was just going to ask if we could have those figures if we don't already have them. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very happy to provide those in detail later. Okay, on that issue, Drew Smith. Um, it, was, it was on another uh, point, convener. Is it not related to that? So, can you yeah, so, so could just clarify in terms of the information relating to the student uh, responses and the positivity from students and you know this whole process. Is there the, the baseline studies you referred to? Uh, so these are all independent studies that have been carried out, independent evaluations? No. Okay. So there, there are a mix, um, but primarily delivered by the funding council. So things like baseline reports will be funding okay. council reports. So, what, so has there ever been an absolute independent study carried out of the, the views of the students and, and the impact of the merger? The, 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 the post-merger evaluations that I referred to are carried out by funding council staff um, with the, the students um, in the colleges. Um, I'm not aware that we've we've sought independent um, views on those. Other than education, education, Ed education Scotland, Scotland will do that. So, so the 140,000 students who have lost a place then, who are no longer students, who probably would have been negatively impacted by this uh, you know, merger, how many of them have been interviewed to ask them their views and the, the impact of the merger in them? There has been a drop of, in headcount of 140,000. That has not been people who've lost their place. They've been people who have finished their course and have moved on, yeah. and, and those courses have not been available, um, yeah. I would accept. To, to be fair, I mean, I'm just asking, so, but, let's, yeah, say, it's, let's yeah. say it's 50,000 then. You know, uh, really, the point I'm asking is, no. out of those 140,000, mm. let's say it's not 140,000, let's say it's 100,000, how many of them have been asked... What's your view on the merger of the colleges? I mean, I mean, it might be that they say, you know, it's fantastic, I've moved on to something else. It might be that they're upset. But have we interviewed them? Have we asked them their views? Have they been surveyed? Yes or no? No, we haven't. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose the question is back again to how do you assess the need in a region? Um, uh, um, because, of course, there's, a, there's new students coming along all the time wanting to do different things. So, but, to, to, See, uh, before I must, but can we just clarify here, though? The question here is, has this had a negative impact on students? Mm -hmm. So that's the question. We've said here it's been a positive experience, and that's what every single member of the panel said so far. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm asking here is, there's 140,000 students, as far as these statistics are concerned, who are no longer in the system. Uh, I'm just asking the question, mm -hmm. is it possible that they have not been in it? We've not asked them their opinion on whether this has been a negative impact. They... I, I Could we just get some order, please, just so that we can hear the... Yeah. I think it would be technically quite difficult to find those students, so, because you're not talking about people who have been at college, because they're, they're now gone. We're talking a large number of the courses that those 140,000 people would have been on were very, very short courses of you know, less than 10 hours. Um, and often that's not the question I'm asking. No, no, it's quite I, clear. I, I mean, the question I'm asking is, yeah. have any of these people been interviewed I, 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 I'm, I'm, if it's been a negative by, impact? No, by saying that, I'm trying to explain how it would be quite difficult to ask them yeah. that question. Why would Students in colleges being impacted, we can ask. Students who hypothetically could have done a course um, that it might have been there had these um, additional places um, still being there are, are harder to ask. Now, what we ask colleges to do as part of their outcome agreement um, is base their provision on a regional skills assessment provided by um, and Skills Development Scotland so that we want them to evident, evidence that they're meeting local need and within the government priorities, which is, the, you know, as Aileen has said, the government has been unapologetic about focusing on full-time courses because they are you know, in times of, you know, of straightened public finances, we need to get the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people, and th th those full-time courses are the most economically beneficial. In that context, we expect colleges to meet local need. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of part-time courses still there. What's happened is the average length of a, of a course has gone up quite a bit. Just a um, bit. Yeah. Even whether they're full time or yeah. part time. But a brief question from Mary Scallon and then David Thomas. Just very brief. Uh, in, in actual fact, from 2009 to 14, the fall in part time students is 151,000. Uh, 2009 to 14, and this is an Audit Scotland figure. So 151,000 fewer part time students, and you're unapologetic about increasing the full time student numbers by 9,000. So we've lost 151,000 part-time 
and gained 9,000. Uh, is that economically beneficial in line with uh, government priorities and uh, is that the right thing to do in hindsight? The reason for the imbalance is that you can, it takes a lot of learning hours or, or credits or sums for one part-time course. Yeah. 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 I'd appreciate that. Yeah. So in one full-time, um, the, the amount of learning activity for one full-time course is considerably more than um, the, a number of part-time courses. In fact, in, in our baseline report, which we published earlier this year, we, we recognise that sometimes it can be as much as 142 part-time courses to create one full-time course, because some of those part-time courses were very short. So that, that explains the imbalance between the reduction in part-time and the increase in full-time. David Thomas. Um, Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, can you tell me how many compulsory redundancies have made by, been made by colleges over the last three years? And uh, do colleges plan to implement compulsory redundancies in the future? And how is it going to be monitored? Um, Scottish ministers have made it clear to colleges that they expect them to reflect um, the public sector pay policy. Um, so they're not bound by it, but the, the expectation has been articulated very clearly by ministers that they should reflect um, and abide by where possible public sector pay policy, which of course states that there should be no compulsory redundancies. Um, we have heard separately about the cost of voluntary severance to the college sector over the course of this reform journey, um, and the absolute majority of exits have been through voluntary severance. I personally am aware of only one compulsory redundancy that has been um, been delivered in one institution, and it was um, you know, subject to a robust business case, and it was because of duplication of posts, um, and you know, across the um, the range of. Um, of merger and transformation that, that that has been delivered across the college sector, um, you know, I think that's that's you know quite a you know clearly a small number in, in terms of of compulsory done. So I don't know if the funding council wants to add to that. I, I'm, uh, I'm also uh, only aware of very very few cases, and those cases were where specific. In fact, there were technical compulsory redundancies because it was a time-limited contract that came to an end. Um, we've we've spoken to Audit Scotland, who I understand may have more information on that. Uh, they're asking college auditors, and and we'll we'll get back that information from from them, and then we'll take a view on you know what the implications of that are. Um, but yes, I, I, as far as I know, it's very very few. Okay, David Scott. Thank you, Convener. Can I ask about the evidence that the Auditor General gave on the 29th of April to this committee when she said that at this stage, and I quote column 34, we do not have it, and that related to the evidence for the £50 million savings that was asserted would be made by this process. Why haven't Audit Scotland been able to provide, provide that information to the committee? Um, can I just I'll say a few opening remarks and I'll, I'll pass across to... Well, I'd really just like an answer to the question. Why haven't Audit Scotland been able to pass that on to the committee? The Funding Council did provide um, figures for severance costs and savings, both to this committee and to Audit Scotland, um, which, and has been noted by Audit Scotland, represents 75% of the total costs. So that's around £46 million. Pounds. The remaining 25% of the costs um, cover a variety of, of issues like ICT or marketing, project management or procurement, shared services. Um, some of that is hard to attribute directly to the merger, for example. Um, and you know, we've been advised by the, some colleges that they don't have systems that allow them to directly attribute these costs to the merger process. And that's why there isn't a totality of, you know, of, of breakdown of the 100% of investment in the merger journey. We expect the merger evaluations, the two-year evaluations, which are in train and expected to conclude by spring of next year, to provide much greater detail in terms of their absolute costs. And one of the um, one of the, the asks of, of Audit Scotland is that the, the, all the costs should be brought together in, in one publication, so they're you know that they are easy to to understand and, and scrutinise. And that's something that the Funding Council understands. So the Auditor General was wrong when she said at this stage we do not have it. Well, I'm, as I've said, the, there isn't a hundred percent detail because we have. Have you read the evidence that the Auditor have, General gave yes. on the 29th of? Are you familiar with it? Well, I, you know, I've read a lot. So you don't of agree evidence. with it? 
Obviously, you don't agree what, with it, given I, your earlier answer. What I'm, what, I, what I'm saying to you is, if the, I, mean, I can't remember the detail of it, if the Auditor General, Auditor General was stating that there wasn't detail on 100% of no, the... No, there's nothing about 100%, uh, if I may say so. There's nothing about anything. You need to be familiar with, you must be familiar with this evidence. This is a core recommendation of Audit Scotland over numerous public sector mergers, for which this is the latest one where the government cannot justify the, 50, the, the figure they asserted would be saved by this process. You must be familiar with the evidence the Auditor General gave, and you must be able to justify it. There's a government, your submission to this committee today has no detail on it, on the £50 million. Pounds. Why not? Well, we, we provided we provided a short submission. I mean, I'll, I'll ask Lawrence to provide. But do you not think this is important? Do you not think it's quite I, important I, I, to justify I, a figure that was made to Parliament about saving on a process that you are you can't justify? Do you not think that, that's important? And I, of course, I absolutely think it's important. Well, so and why isn't it in the submission to this committee? Well, if we, we absolutely can provide subsequent evidence to the committee if that would be helpful about the detail of this. And I'll ask Lawrence to say a few words about how we how we worked up the fifty million pounds expected efficiency savings and, and the assurance that we have that they will start to be delivered from 15-16, if that would be helpful. There's, um, there's two, two issues here. There's the costs of merger and the efficiencies that result from merger. Um, so what we do have, and that's available in the public domain, is what, what, what did the business plan say they expected mergers to cost at the beginning of the process? We have a, Which was a how much out of interest? Sorry? Which was how much out of interest? And John, do you remember? Sorry, how well, um, Mr. Howells just plans? asserted something. I'd just be grateful for the evidence of that. The, 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 business, the business plans for the mergers were producing savings of around about the 50 million we'd estimated back in 2012. And Audit Scotland couldn't find any evidence of that? I, to be fair, I don't think that is exactly what the Audit Scotland report says. Read. The, the, <laughs> let's just, we, let's, well, should we look at that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, co uh, paragraph 31. None of the fieldwork colleges could provide detailed information on merger costs and efficiency savings. Yeah. Quote, none. Yeah. The, the next sentence is only information on the larger merger costs, um, such as voluntary severance and reduced staffing costs, which are considerably larger than some of the other savings that the Audit Scotland fieldwork colleges said that they were having difficulty oh, providing. So right. Now, wh when you um, heard from um, Audrey Cumberford and Paul Little just a couple of weeks ago, they, they were able to evidence how they had made those savings. Um, and our view is that as we do the post-manager evaluations, there will be evidence on that. Now, in our discussions um, with the Auditor General staff as they were preparing the report, I, I understood the issue to be, and I think that's reflected in the wording in the report, that on things like ICT savings and some of the other smaller savings, it is harder to, to measure the baseline over, you know, and over several years talk about how three colleges coming together has saved money as opposed to general upgrading and so on. Um, on the bulk of the merger savings, which are staff savings, um, we are absolutely confident. We have robust information. We know how much we spent. We know how much has been saved um, because we had fairly strict rules on one-year payback for our investment and so on. So my understanding of the Auditor-General's report is that there is a proportion of the savings for which they are not confident that the colleges have robust ways of measuring at this stage, um, not that there is no evidence on the merger savings. I suspect that's all entirely fair, okay. but th and that's not my point. When was the £50 million pound figure first put into the public domain by the government or by the Funding Council? It, it was, I think, probably in 2012. Exactly. So uh, if it was in 2012, what was the basis for it in 2012? This is an audit report that looks at yeah. what has happened, not is what is yeah. happening now. The, yeah. The basis of the 50 million estimate in 2012 um, was that we had looked at previous experience of mergers, including the City of Glasgow merger, which had um, you know, just taken place a year or two before, and we'd seen the business case for the Edinburgh merger, which again was slightly before um, you know, these series of mergers. And we'd looked at our experience from other mergers in the higher education sector, um, and we had estimated that mergers on the scale that we're talking about would save um, roughly, if they were the same size as City of Glasgow, around about five million a year. Now, City of Glasgow have said that they've actually saved slightly more than that, but we've been quite conservative in our estimates. And we then scaled the 
um, the other mergers um, you know, to that, and we produced an estimate of around £50 million. Now, that, over time, has changed because some of the mergers have taken place in different ways, and actually there's been more mergers than I think we were anticipating at that time. But broadly, that £50 million um, estimate has remained um, the one we've worked with. We think it's robust. Um, and I think the evidence you heard from Audrey Cumberford and Paul Little just a couple of weeks ago you know, bears that out, and that the, the levels of savings that they talked about um, are consistent with our estimate. But I therefore don't understand how, how the Auditor General could tell this committee on the 29th of April, and I quote, at this stage, the fund, that's the 29th of April, at this stage, the, count, the, the Funding Council and the Government could not give us, Audit Scotland, the information that we asked for to demonstrate the costs of the merger process. Um, I mean, clearly, we can't speak for the Auditor General in terms of, of what was intended by that. But my understand how I understood that um, was about the, the entirety of of the spend. So it's that you know I come back to I'm um, sorry the the hundred percent our ability to um, to robustly demonstrate the spend of around 75% that on staff severances and, and related costings and that the, you know and the, the inability at this stage to provide absolute detail around the remaining 25% but we're hopeful that that, that further that further detail around that will be provided through the post merger evaluation so, so so in terms of the future again um, this committee who are meant to look at these things in the context of the audit Scotland advice to the government in relation to merger processes but this is not the first and it won't be the last I dare say um, we should just basically not worry about the figure that's given out by the government when it first starts, because you guys will just basically justify it later on. Yeah. Well, that's what's happened. Again, yeah. that's what's happened. That's the evidence no, of this committee. No, we, we are um, confident Again. that the figure that we gave um, in 2012 will be achieved. Um, I the, as I understand it, there are two uncertainties um, that Audit Scotland discussed with us in preparing the port. One was, as I've said, um, you know, how, how much savings do you get from ICT by the end of the, um, the, pro you know, the merger project? Um, and we will have a better idea of that after the post-merger evaluations. But the other one is on the, the, co the total costs of the merger. We have very robust information on the, of what we funded as part of the merger process and how that you know, has been spent. But I can understand but, all that now, Mr Kemp. I'm sure you're absolutely right about that. I'm, I absolutely believe you on that. Now, mm -hmm. my point, though, as you rightly said earlier on, is in 2012, um, the government asserted it would save £50 million. Audit Scotland have told us, and it's in the report and it was in the evidence on the 29th of, of uh, April, that there was, there was no, quote, evidence for that. Yeah. So why should I, as a parliamentarian, believe anyone who makes a statement they're going to save X yeah. when, when you can't justify it? Yeah. Well, my understanding of Auditor General's report is that she's saying that there is a proportion that of, and of both of the savings and of the costs that she has not got absolute evidence on. What we're saying is that is a small proportion, and what we funded, we are, we are very confident of. OK, I'm going round in circles and getting yeah. nowhere here. Um, let me try a different tack then. Um, is the 50 million savings achieved through a reduction in central funding to colleges, or can, be direct, can it be directly attributed to reform activity? The, the 50 million savings um, is, uh, a, 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 is an efficiency saving which results from the college sector delivering more volume uh, for less money in real terms. That's the big macro, macro picture. Uh, so, it's a, so it's a cut in, in, in the, as you rightly said, I think that's very fair it's, to It's an efficiency uh, on the sector. It's delivering more for, in real terms, less. Uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 the college sector, we don't believe the college sector would have been able to deliver that reform uh, uh, without the benefit of reform, the, the regionalisation, which has enabled them to become more efficient, uh, and that's what the programme is about. In addition to becoming more efficient, as I think we've demonstrated before, we think that the regional colleges are also more effective. There's a great respect. I wasn't asking about that. I'm, this is the audit committee. I'm asking about the money. Mm -hmm. and, and what I was asking is, is the £50 million savings a reduction in central funding to colleges, which I think you've confirmed it is, as opposed to the reform process? The, the, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yes, I repeat my answer. The, it, uh, I think these two things have gone on at the same time. In order to deliver the, uh, the, the efficiencies required by uh, the change in, in central funding, the colleges have, have, have been more, become more efficient through mergers. Right. Thank you. Okay. Don't have any further questions. Uh, so, don't have any further questions. So, I thank the panel for their 
contribution this morning and I'll move the committee into a, a brief five minute uh, suspension. Convened, so can I uh, draw members' attention to agenda item number three? Uh, we have evidence on the AGS report entitled Managing ICT Contracts in Central Government, uh, an update. I'd like to welcome Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Angela Cullen, the Assistant Director, <coughs> uh, Gemma Diamond, the Senior Manager, and Morog uh, Campsey, the Auditor Manager and of Audit Scotland. Understand the Auditor General is a brief opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Today's report looks at the progress that the Scottish Government and central government bodies have meant, made against the recommendations in my August 2012 report on managing ICT contracts. Information technology provides the opportunity to transform public services, and the right skills and support are essential to make sure that this investment delivers real benefits for users and is done in a cost effective way. Failure to successfully manage IT programmes will affect the public both directly and indirectly. We know that managing IT programmes is complex and that it continues to be a challenge for the Scottish Government and central government bodies. In our 2012 report, we highlighted problems that Registers of Scotland, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and Disclosure Scotland had encountered when managing their IT contracts. 
The report made a number of recommendations for the government to help strengthen the strategic oversight of IC programmes and to improve the access to skills for central government bodies. Today's report reviews progress against those recommendations and uses information provided by the local auditors at 12 central government bodies to explore the problems they encountered when managing IT programmes and how they resolved them. Our report highlights that while the Scottish Government has made some progress in trying to improve its strategic oversight and the access to, to the skills that are needed, this hasn't been fully effective and significant progress is still needed. I'll briefly highlight three key themes from the report. First of all, on oversight. Following our previous, previous report, the Scottish Government introduced new assurance and oversight arrangements. It developed an assurance framework for ICT programmes to support central government bodies and to gather information for Scottish Government oversight, um, as part of which the Information Systems Investment Board was responsible for ensuring that bodies followed the framework. We found, though, that these arrangements haven't been effective. The framework itself wasn't clear enough, which may have resulted in fewer ICT projects being reported to the board, and the board didn't have sufficient staff and information to perform its oversight role. The Scottish Government has recently updated its oversight arrangements, creating the Office of the Chief Information Officer in February 2015 to support the board. But the roles and responsibilities of the board and the Office of the Chief Information Officer are still in the process of being finalised. Secondly, on access to skills, as with our 2012 report, we found that the lack of key skills is still a significant problem. Public bodies are competing with the private sector for people with skills that are scarce right across the economy, and some are using short-term contractors to fill their skills gaps, which may be costly and requires effective knowledge transfer. In 2012, we recommended that the Scottish Government should undertake a skills gap assessment, but this wasn't done until August 2014. The Government is now developing a new approach by pooling and sharing resources in a digital transformation service. This is an ambitious initiative and the detailed arrangements again are still being put in place. Thirdly, on central government bodies' progress, we've used case studies to identify and share what has worked and what hasn't around the public sector. It's clear that while some progress has been made, there are still areas such as defining benefits and managing contractors and suppliers where improvements are needed. We found that bodies are using appropriate project management techniques and that more bodies are using the agile technique, but some lack the skills and experience they needed for this approach. We also provide a short update on three of the bodies that were the subject of my earlier report. I should note, convener, that in relation to Disclosure Scotland, we're unable to comment further at the moment on the procurement of the new contract awarded in May of 2014 due to continuing discussions between Disclosure Scotland and ATOS about non-completion of the contract. I will, of course, update the committee in due course as appropriate. As always, convener, we're happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Scanlon. Uh, yes, I think the, the, the major part in the report for me was um, page 19, part two, addressing the skills gap and shortages and uh, being one of the old hands on this committee. I was here when uh, we took evidence in uh, 2012. Um, now, as you say, uh, there was a recommendation August 2012. The report highlighted the lack of skills was a key factor in the failure of central government bodies ICT programmes. It was quite serious and I actually thought it was being taken seriously by government. Um, so I was... Uh, quite shocked that it took two years uh, to do a skills gap survey that was done in August 2014, two years after your report, and an action plan was set six months later. Now, the reason that I was shocked is that um, I actually had the response by Paul Gray, the Director General, to the 2012 report. And Paul Gray's uh, response um, gave us an absolute categoric assurance that everything was being done. And uh, he gave evidence to this committee on behalf of the government. And his uh, paper to the committee was October 2012. Um, and if I can just say uh, a couple of lines... We're working towards an action plan for central government ICT workforce to be available uh, across the sector. 
Um, this will be informed by data collection on the size of the ICT workforce carried out for benchmarking purposes and starting 1st October 2012, collection of information on the skills and capability of the workforce and future needs. Now, that was October 2012. So I sat back naively and optimistically and took them at their word. Now... Was this committee misled by this information? Because uh, we were given an assurance in October 2012 in a significant four-page response from the Director-General, and I know you will have seen that paper, but we were given quite a categoric assurance, and I was absolutely content with everything they were doing. So we set it aside, and you come back, Auditor-General, two years later to say... That this categoric assurance isn't worth the paper it's written on. In fact, it didn't take them from August to October 2012. It took them from August 2012 to August 2014 to even think about the skills survey and then six months later an action plan. Um, can I ask for your comments on... on I mean, I'm, I'm sure you will be very familiar with this uh, response to your report... Uh, and to this committee uh, in 2012. In my view, Ms Scanlon, the um, skills gap analysis should have been carried out sooner. That's one of the couple of key messages in my report. Um, I think it's fair to say it's not that nothing was done during that period. Um, we know, for example, um, that the Scottish Government set up a cross-public sector workforce stream um, in 2013 to address the commitment that had been made in the digital strategy and other pieces of work were happening. But the skills gap analysis itself didn't take place until last year and I think that has made it harder for the Government to be thinking about how it addresses this um, shortage of skills that we know affects the whole economy. You heard some of that yeah. in the earlier evidence session um, and I think that may be a question that you, the committee may want to pick up with the Scottish Government why it took as long as it did to address the, to analyse the yeah. skills gap and then to think about the right response to tackling yes, that. that. No, that's very reasonable but I just wonder during your uh, inquiry during your gathering of data um, if you discovered why a promise made in October um, 2012 uh, you know, to the satisfaction of this committee, um, I wondered in the collection of data and in your investigations if you discovered why it took another two years to carry out the promises we were given. I'm, I'm not sure we can speculate okay. on the reasons why it took as long as it did. We do know that, that some things happened during that two-year period, but the skills gap analysis itself didn't happen until the date set out in my report, and I think it should have been done sooner. OK, can, can I just ask, um, I'd just like a, a, an update on Rose, but prior to that, given that the skills, the ICT skills, were a problem uh, in 2012, you know, we're talking three years ago now, Given that they're a problem then, they are a very serious problem now. Um, are you concerned that there seems to be little alignment between the Scottish Government's priorities, indeed the country's priorities, for ICT specialists and a fall of 25,000 places uh, in FE in recent years? And I'm talking HNC, HND and uh, degrees. We haven't looked at that in detail. As you know, the report we produced on colleges was looking primarily at the reform process. Yeah. Um, I think there may be a case for us looking at some point at the way in which the broader um, economic focus on digital skills is being taken forward right across the piece through the funding council in colleges, yeah. through Skills Development Scotland, through the higher education sector. But I'm not in a position now to comment on it. But you I would expect if there's a skills gap in a particular area... You would expect the government and the director general to be talking to the universities and colleges. That's where the skills come from. I think it, that's one of the potential benefits of the government's outcome approach, is to take yeah. what it wants to achieve and then join up all the parts of the public sector yeah. to, to deliver it. We haven't looked in detail at how well that's happening or not at the moment, um, but we, we do know, as we've said here, that IT skills are a significant challenge for Scottish public bodies and for the wider economy, um, and that the skills gap analysis of the internal skills that are lacking took longer to happen um, than I would have expected on the back of the 2012 report. Yeah. And just my final question, Convener, uh, we heard about uh, Registers of Scotland last time you were here. And um, 
you know, I, I have read through it, but I wouldn't say... I mean, it's not exactly a ringing endorsement that everything's wonderful, but, uh, you know, recognises it needs to have the capacity to maintain service delivery. I mean, should we be confident that the ICT systems in Ross are fit for purpose now, given that they do have significant additional responsibilities? I'll ask Gemma or Morag to come in in a moment on the specifics of Registers of Scotland. Um, what we've tried to do through this report is to, to look closely at the progress that Scottish Government and the bodies have made in addressing our recommendations about yeah. strategic oversight and skills yeah. and to give you an update on where they are. Okay. We haven't done an audit that would let us give you that full assurance that everything is now fine and I hope we've okay. made that clear in the report. Yeah. We've reported they've made some progress. Yeah. Morag Gemma, who would like to give us a bit more on that? Yes, um, as we see in the, the appendix, um, there has been a, 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 um, some issues and obviously a lot of um, large projects with the Land Registration Act and also, also um, delivering the requirements under um, the Land and Building Transaction Tax. Um, they have um, brought in the, the um, some new people over the last year and they have just um, ish, um, produced their digital strategy um, at the beginning of the year and have plans in place for some uh, significant pieces of work obviously the Land Registration Completion Act uh, as well um, so they have um, obviously been given priority to these large pieces of work and have had to bring in agency staff to deal with the day-to-day -day running um, and that's something that, that, that we are keeping an eye on along with the local auditors there. I noticed there have been quite a lot of changes of staff, new staff coming and more agency staff and yeah, I, I just wondered how stable it was going forward. Thank you. Yeah, I have to say in a, in a past life of uh, had responsibility and oversight over very large ICT projects, and not one of them comes in on budget, on time, or indeed delivers exactly what people want. That's, that seems to be the way of ICT, uh, ICT uh, projects. However, in this particular case, you know, I'm aware that there is in fact a global shortage, not just in the UK but worldwide, of uh, ICT experts, for want of a better word. Um, Clearly, you've highlighted here that this is an issue for the Scottish Government, indeed, across the UK. To what extent do you think that uh, unavailability of the, that level of skill, how is that impacting on the Scottish Government's progress in putting in place the measures it's looking for? Because clearly they've made progress. Clearly they're heading, in, it would appear, in the right direction. But this critical skills shortage... Uh, which is something that, frankly, I'm at a loss to know what to do about. How is that impacting on the progress they're making? You're right. This is a complex area. It's one that doesn't just affect the Scottish Government. It affects public services right across the UK and more widely and private sector companies. We've seen the problems RBS has had in the last week or so with their IT systems. This is a, a widespread problem. Um, and we're not suggesting there's a magic wand that the government can pull out and wave and, and make everything OK. Um, we do think, as we said in the earlier report, there's more the government can do to keep strategic oversight of projects and to um, identify where things are progressing less well than planned and stepping in to avoid the problems really crystallising. And we think there's more that can be done to help develop that pool of skilled staff that Ms Scanlon was talking about that can work across different public bodies rather than each having to grow their own. In terms of the specific of the, of the impact that it has, I think it operates at two levels. One, we do see, see significant projects like the um, Cap Futures IT system that I've reported on to you before, like NHS 24 that we're still monitoring and will come back to you on due course, where major investment goes off track with um, significant costs being incurred on turning that round and potentially an impact on people who rely on those services or the payments that they generate. So we see it at that level. I think almost more importantly, there's the opportunity cost of what could be achieved with um, really well-managed investment in IT in transforming services to make them more responsive to people's needs and to make efficiency savings that would help us to close the gap between the funding that's available, the um, Scottish Government's priorities and people's expectations around Scotland. And it's that transformation potential, I think, which is really at risk because of the skills gap. Do, do we not come back to the basic... Uh question which is 
civil servants in this particular role get paid very substantially less than the market. You've highlighted that yourself. Are they working around this by hiring contractors at a higher price in order to compensate for that? I mean, I don't know what else they would do. To an extent, they are doing that. You're right. We, we make that point here, and we highlight the importance when you're doing that of making sure that you do have good arrangements for transferring knowledge and skills from the contractor to the in-house team so that you don't lose all of the expertise and experience as soon as the contract mm -hmm. ends. Um, I think there is also something more that could be done, which the government is aiming to do through the new digital transformation service, for really building those skills among in-house staff, um, working with the FE sector mm -hmm. and Skills Development Scotland and to set up modern apprenticeships in the right area. Mm -hmm. It's a long-term thing. It's not going to mm -hmm. fix it overnight, but it could generate some of those skills over a longer period and avoid that reliance on expensive, short-term skills from the private sector. Just one other point uh, on paragraph 30. I was quite surprised to see the comment uh, about the, uh, what's it called, the Information Systems Investment Board uh, not getting responses from government departments. That seems pretty outrageous, doesn't it? Um, we're, we're working very hard to avoid acronyms this morning, convener. I know you don't <laughs> like them, so we'll try quite hard to stick to them. Thank you for that. Um, yes, we were concerned that the Information Systems Investment Board was set up as a key part of the government's oversight um, and wasn't in a position to carry out that role effectively. I think there were two reasons. First of all, the, the guidance wasn't clear about which projects fell under its remit um, in terms of how you calculate the cost and which are the risky ones that should come in. And secondly, the board didn't have the capacity to chase up the bodies that weren't submitting the information that was required. Um, we think that did significantly limit its ability to carry out its role. The government has recognised that and is now changing the arrangements under the oversight of the Office of the Chief Information Officer. But again, it's something which is taking longer to put in place than um, we had expected given the changes that were put in in 2012 and onwards. You made comment on the staffing in that area. Uh, is it techies that are in there primarily? It, it's still uh, unfolding, the new arrangements under the Digital Transformation Service. And I'll ask Gemma, if I may, to give you a bit more of a feel of how that's coming together. It's still work in progress, though. So the Office of the Chief Information Officer was just created um, in February and that has, is actually quite a small office. There's currently only four staff within that office. The Digital Transformation Service as part of the Digital Directorate is just being established and they're kind of going through the arrangements now to recruiting staff. Um, and you might, the Scottish Government will be able to provide an update on that certainly later on as those arrangements are just still taking place at the moment. So the new arrangements are really kind of just being put into place at the moment. Okay, so, so it is very, very recent. I mean, my concern was reading this that uh, they weren't getting responses from the government bodies and how to ensure that happened, because clearly it's a key part of this. It absolutely is. Um, we think that the new arrangements have got the potential to resolve that. The framework itself is clearer. There will be dedicated staffing now in the Office of the Chief Information Officer and the new Digital Transformation Service, but we're, we're not in a position yet to say that it will work in practice. As Gemma says, it really is still developing as we speak this morning. Can I just, uh, in terms of in paragraph 75 of the report, and we've referred to this earlier about you know how complex these programmes are, ICT programmes are uh, complex and you say government should consider how best to manage them. I mean, I, I would probably guess that that statement's been made in various reports probably since the Parliament uh, first began. I mean, probably going back to 1999, various reports would refer to the fact that these are complex arrangements uh, and, you know, we need to get a grip of them. It's, we've seen in UK government challenges in the health service about you know, the role of ICT programmes. Is there not a need for perhaps a more you know, thought? I mean, we, we just seem to say this. Governments seem to, you know, let's have a new digital approach to this. There's all buzzwords that get used. It's not come a stage where we have to think we've tried all of this before for so many years. Really, since the internet's been invented, we've, yeah. we've referred to this. The specific comment in paragraph 75 is about the project management technique you use for a specific IT project. Yeah. And there isn't a one-size-fits-all um, arrangement that you can say is the best one to use for every central government project. Um, and that, that's an issue that I think um, 
does need more skills at a local level and more support through the Scottish Government. I think your wider point, though, is that government here and governments more generally aren't very good at this. Um, it, it is something which has been reported on repeatedly in Scotland, at a UK level, and more widely. Um, and I think that the... Um, changes which the government is now proposing to put in place, both through its oversight arrangements and through the Digital Transformation Service, have the potential to make a difference. And as I say in a carefully worded phrase in the report, it's ambitious. <coughs> Doing it is going to be difficult. I think the problem is, convener, though, that nobody knows what the right answer is. Yeah. Uh, private companies aren't sure. great at this either in many instances. So, can, can I just say, could the argument about this be, by the, by the time we reach the stage where we're trying to take it forward, the technology is overtaking the. I mean, I mean, it's just the pace of technology. Uh, you know, almost just. I mean, it, you know, it's running in a twin track, and the government's in that track, and technology is another one, and it's overtaking it. Every opportunity. I mean, that's. I, I don't. I, I think there's an element of truth in that, and I don't think it helps very much, given we know that government can't simply opt out of um, the, the opportunities that come from these sorts of changes. We all expect it as citizens and service users, people across Scotland do, and in order to make the savings that are needed, we all need to make much better use of technology in future. But there is something, I think, about making the investment in having as good skills and processes as we, as we can afford as a government, as a, a set of public services in Scotland, to, to get the most from it and to minimise the chances of it going wrong. And I think certainly up until now, the Scottish Government's approach hasn't demonstrated that it can do that. Davis Scott. Yeah, thank you. Can I just ask, uh, Kavino, uh, on page 22, you've got a case study about the um, uh, Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme, which you raised earlier with the committee, and indeed we had a letter from you again on the 29th of, of June. And that, at that time, I was just looking it up, said that the delivery partner costs had gone up, this is the IT delivery partner costs, had gone up from 28.8 million to 60.4 million, a 111% rise. Is what you're seeing in the case study here the reason for that increase, the turnover of staff? Is that your understanding of what's kind of um, I, think, gone wrong there. I think there's a wider range of things going on there. You might recall that I produced a Section 22 report yeah. on it towards the back end of 2014, um, and without going into the detail of that, the skills gap was a problem in it. it there was also um, challenges caused by the complexity of what the EU is requiring and by the broad scope of what the government was planning initially as part of the CAP Futures programme. All of those things contributed. Um, I will be producing another report to the committee later this year on progress on the back of the Scottish Government audit. I know it's, a, it's significant public money and of great concern um, to constituents of members of this committee, so we're watching it closely. That's one element, but not the only one in that particular so it's, case no, study. I appreciate that, and thank you for that. So it's just that um, in your case study, you particularly mentioned that the programme had to fill two key senior management program management roles using as you, fixed term contracts, which I think you were alluding to in the, in the answer to both Colin Beatty and the convener. Um, so it's not, I mean, I'm trying to gauge what part of this project, where did this project really go wrong? Because a 111% rise in cost by any standards is pretty concerning. Um, at this stage, um, we don't know just, it's well, be at this stage, I'd rather refer you back to my yeah, section 22 fine. report yeah. that set out yeah. that and a range of other factors. Yeah. We are continuing to monitor it. We know that there are continuing challenges for the team. I don't want to, to jump into that midstream, if you like, without sure, having a, a formal yeah. update for the committee yeah. to okay. found on. Thank you very much. Sandra Wright. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I want to go back to this uh, skills gap and what you said in your opening remarks uh, in regards to competing with the private sector. It seems to come up constantly in the report, and I know that uh, Colin Beatty had also mentioned that uh, the SQA and Register of Scotland and other bodies haven't been able to retain what you might call skilled staff because of the huge difference in costs. So the way I see it is it's not necessarily a skills gap. It's the fact that the, you know, the salaries are so low compared to the private sector, would that be a correct analysis? You're talking double in the private sector. 
I, I think it's. I think that's a symptom of the wider problem. The wider problem is that, that there is simply a, a, a UK-wide and probably a global shortage of those skills. And because the public sector is more constrained in salary terms, for reasons we all understand, when people are competing for a skilled project manager or a data analyst, the private sector tends to win out more often than not. Now, mm -hmm. there's, there's not a quick answer to that, except going through the, the sorts of process we were talking about earlier of developing a pool that all public bodies can call on rather than each body needing its own skilled people and investing in the training and development of those people for Scotland as a whole so it doesn't turn into a bidding war. But can I just follow that up? I mean this, the point I'm trying to make is private sector don't seem to have a big problem even though these skills are paid for through the public sector yeah. uh, you know people going to obviously university etc private sector don't seem to be short in these skills it's a public sector more than anything else and what concerns me, you know, is the comments constantly about, you know, shortage of these skills when the private sector can harness and, and can employ these people. What's to say if we have a huge pool of this skilled staff, they will all go into the public sector when they're getting double the money in the skilled sector? It's a really good point to explore. Mm -hmm. Can I refer you to Exhibit 6 on page 21? Yeah, I've got um, it, yeah. There's a table there which shows, first of all, the, the skills gap, as it's called here. That's the skills that are missing within Scottish Government and public bodies, according to their own survey of what they need. If you look across to the right-hand column, those mm -hmm. are the skills shortages, the ones which actually people in the private sector as well struggle to recruit and retain. That's not to say nobody's got them, but it does mean that people tend to move from job to job um, in return for an, another pay rise or better terms and conditions. Um, and that, I think, contributes back to why some of the programmes where there is a private contractor involved can still struggle. People are still moving on because their skills are in short supply and they're, they're moving repeatedly. So the only answer to that shortage is really to invest in more people who've got the skills, to develop them and to make sure they're available in the economy more widely. Mm -hmm. the, the pay thing is a short-term fix, but you're always vulnerable to the next person with a bigger chequebook making a better offer. Yeah. So even, sorry, Kendrina, even if you have a huge pool we're not necessarily guaranteed that these people will work in the public sector I if they're to able to get... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, Mill. Oh, thank you, Kimbia. It's uh, just For me, I, mean, I think the most important um, phrase uh, in this whole uh, report, uh, it's, it's been touched on earlier, paragraph 75, that you yourself highlighted, Convener, uh, and that's uh, <laughs> the issue of it. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, and uh, prior to getting a, uh, being elected to, to the Parliament, uh, I'd worked for a, an IT uh, company, and uh, at a lower level, I was compared to call them BT, uh, but hasten to add. But uh, uh, but certainly, as soon as a as soon as a piece of kit, as, as soon as a piece of kit left the factory, it was out of date, and that, that's just that's just the nature of the business. And uh, and things have moved on hugely since then. Uh, and the and in terms of this report. I mean, uh, I mean, for me, uh, the huge challenge to any public body, uh, and whether it's in Scotland, across the, the UK, or anywhere else, is that when it comes to an ICT solution uh, for a, for an organisation, it's a bespoke solution. And the, that whole issue of, of the, the one size fits all, it just cannot happen, because every organisation is different, every public body is different, and. Uh, Certainly, I mean, the private sector, they do get it wrong as well. Uh, and, and it costs the private sector uh, huge amounts of additional uh, finance as well. And, uh, and I just, it's one of these areas where um, no, no organisation is ever going to get this correct. I just put the, the, the complex nature of trying to devise an ICT solution. Uh, and I just I wanted to get that on the record because I, I don't think there are I don't think everyone actually uh, fully well not everyone in here but certainly outside as well would actually fully appreciate uh, the fact that it, these are bespoke solutions for individual organisations. I think you're right that a lot of what we're talking about in here are bespoke solutions, either because nobody else needs to provide a service like that, or because the way in which um, the policy direction takes it means you're trying to do something that, that's not simply an off-the-shelf solution. That's absolutely a fact, and it affects the way banks develop their IT systems and major retailers and everything else, as well as the internet-based 
businesses that are so important these days. On the other hand, I don't think that's a reason for government to say it's all too hard and either we're not going to do it at all or we accept that it's going to go wrong. Um, and I think the two things about getting good governance and good oversight in place and doing what we can to, to build that skill base and to make sure that it's available to all public bodies rather than each needing their own are the things that, that could make a difference against that difficult background. No, exactly, I, and I, I do not challenge uh, what you said there at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I absolutely agree with it. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I think that, that understanding, Absolutely. that wider understanding needs to be appreciated. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank could, you. I, could I possibly add to that, uh, convener? Um, I think in this report, and the Auditor General mentioned it in our opening statements, is that we've used case studies to highlight, and there are a lot of case studies in this report compared to some of our other reports, some of them highlighting um, things that perhaps didn't go well or why problems have been experienced. But we've, we've also highlighted where where we have looked at things in individual bodies at different stages of those projects that we thought were interesting, that others may want to go and look at and think about, that's a different way of doing it, I hadn't thought about doing that, as, and, and maybe pick up on some of those lessons and share them more widely. So we absolutely appreciate there's no one-size-fits-all. We are trying to direct bodies to, hear something you might want to think about doing. Bruce Smith. <coughs> Return to uh, the point that uh, Sandra White was making around, uh, since I suppose, the competition between the public sector and the private sector in terms of recruitment. Um, I wondered if the Auditor General had found any evidence of you know, maybe more innovative examples of recruitment um, and encouraging people perhaps to spend part of their career or a, you know, a shorter time in the public sector um, or attracting people to the, to the, to the public sector on you know, with things other than pay, um, you, you know, the, some people may be uh, prepared to, to to work in health and education because they might, uh, you know, value the the benefits that that would have for society, but also for their career or in terms of location and, and people wanting to work in Scotland who are perhaps not otherwise based in Scotland. Were there any examples of that or do you think there's more that could be done? I'm going to ask Gemma and Morag in a moment if we've got any specific examples. Before then, though, I think it's worth saying that one of the government's aims for the Digital Transformation Service is to do exactly that sort of thing, mm. to think about how you could give people new and unusual career paths that might bring in modern apprentices and, and give them the chance to get experience early on of different types of projects, to bring people people in with a, a really um, uh, uh, exciting project to transform the way that e-health operates, yeah. for example, but to do that in a way which doesn't rely on each body having to, to bear the risk itself doing it at a Scotland-wide level. Gemma and Morag, anything we can add to that from experience so far? We know that as part of um, the, the, the workforce stream that they did as part from the digital strategy that they, did, they, they are trying exactly that to really to kind of promote um, working within um, the ICT sector, within the public sector. Um, it's not just based on pay, but the other benefits that go alongside that. So that is something that they are, are looking at. And like the Auditor General said, the Digital um, Skills um, Transformation Service is really kind of looking to, to do that, to try and bring people in to say, look, you can actually work on some really, really interesting ICT projects in the central government. There's a lot, there's a lot going on. You don't have to work on just one. You can work across a number and to try and provide that kind of career pathway for people to try and encourage people to stay within the central government sector for longer. So they are looking at that to try and try and make that career pathway for people to try and encourage people to stay. Mm -hmm. I suppose, I mean, I think that, that would be welcome, but is there also an opportunity, though, for people who, may, who maybe don't want to have a career in the public services but would be prepared to spend... Uh, you know, part of their career, so you know, a, a few years working. At, at, I'm thinking of particularly people, um, you know, perhaps working internationally, and we might be prepared to come come to Scotland to, to work on a specific project for a period of time because they believe it would enhance their CV and also they would get things out of it other than monetary reward. I think you're right, and I think there are two dimensions to that. At the moment, I think that's primarily happening through the sort of contracting route that we talked about a bit earlier. Um, Mr Scott talked about the CAP Futures programme, where the um, programme directors, senior people, have been on short-term contracts. It's very important in those circumstances that you are doing what you can to make sure they transfer their skills and experience yeah. to their teams, so you're not back to square one yeah. when they leave. Um, more generally, I think there probably is, as part of the Digital Transformation Service, a real place for thinking, are there people maybe in their 50s who are coming towards the end of a career in the private sector who might want to give something back, to work yeah. for a lower salary for a period of time to really change the way public services are delivered? Mm -hmm. And I think there probably is an opportunity. I'm not sure we've seen much concrete evidence of that so far, um, but it's the sort of thing that I would expect the government to be planning into the Digital Transformation Service and the approach that it takes to doing it. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, one of the things that got me as I was reading through this report um, uh, yesterday evening was, and a lot of it's been covered here, I'll try not to uh, uh, jump on top of what's been already said, but <coughs> obviously looking through the report and the idea of the skill shortages, you see, I rather got the impression reading this last night before I'd listened to what had been said today that um, some of the problems we're being faced with um, in terms of the timescales, some things not being done and the likes, simply is because the skill shortage is there and it, I'm just not being able to, to do this. The other thing was, on the back of it, given the, uh, shall we say, dubious uh, reputation, shall we say, of some public contracts in the past that have gone out, um, in terms of the senior project management of these uh, a, a projects, uh, whereby they may not be, the people running them may not be technically knowing of what is required, but perhaps have a degree of interference. Has there been any... Um, I know that was one of the things that I was a bit <coughs> concerned about in the last report that you brought through, and we obviously seen some uh, uh, poor management practices that were brought through in your last report, but how do you feel about what you've seen just now? Because I do see a degree of improvement, particularly with the likes of the case studies that you put in at the end, good practice that's brought in, as well as some of the things that haven't happened. I was just wondering, has there been any evidence of interference, perhaps, that there shouldn't have been? Um, can I ask you to elaborate a bit on the question about the sort of interference you might be Well, simply about? because of the fact that in terms of the clarity that is given uh, in terms of where this project is, where it has got to be mm -hmm. at a particular time, and uh, as we're going through suddenly making a different policy decision, shall we say, to veer off and cause problems for those who are actually trying to implement the project. I don't think that's come up as being a major issue in the work that we've done here. The work, uh, the, the problems that we've seen that have continued, and you're right, there have been some improvements, but the areas where we think that there hasn't been enough progress are, first of all, the arrangements for oversight and um, problem solving and support when things are behind through the Information Systems Investment Board, and secondly, the work to really understand what are the skills that are missing and start investing in developing them in the public sector. Um, it can be a problem with projects um, that the requirements change or that under Agile particularly, particularly it becomes clear that you couldn't do what you originally planned to do because the technology won't support it or it's too complex and you then have to reshape your plans to meet the, the timescale and the resources you have got. We've seen that happening but I wouldn't see that as being interference in the way that I think you're asking about. Gemma or Morag, do you want to add anything to that? No? Nothing to add. Yeah, it was just a thought that some of the things here had been not as quick as it could have been because of X, Y, Z, whatever it may have mm -hmm. been. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just a brief final question from Mary Scallon. <coughs> I'm sorry for going back three years, but we were actually promised then by the government that they would have a strategic oversight of significant ICT programmes. And part one of your report, starting uh, paragraph 10, uh, that strategic oversight uh, led to an ICT assurance framework in February 2013, which was not clear enough and has not enabled the government to fulfil its oversight role. That's total failure. And then paragraph two, the Information Systems Investment Board was to... Uh, oversee the implementation of the framework, but it didn't have sufficient information. I mean, you just couldn't make this up. Uh, or capacity to perform its role. And as if that wasn't bad enough, it didn't receive all the ICT investment and assurance information required from government bodies. I mean, this is just total incompetence and failure. We've got promises made three years ago of a strategic oversight. I won't rehearse the arguments given then with Ross and BT and the need for a central strategic overview. But we've also got the government where one part of the government can't talk to the other and they're trying to look at a framework which isn't, uh, in your own words, Auditor General, the framework wasn't clear enough to enable the government to fulfil its role. I mean, if you were given marks out of ten, you would barely have a one there. I mean... That's really serious failure. And if we look at the skills gap, 
The government can look to the universities, it can look to the FE colleges, it can look to its apprenticeship programme, it can talk to SDS. There's a huge role there. So I think it's all very well sitting back and blaming one person or another or the private sector pay higher salaries. They only do that because of supply and demand and we have insufficient people uh, coming forward. So can I just ask... Are you disappointed about the promise of the strategic oversight that was made on the basis of the four organisations that you looked at last time and the problems that they had? Uh, and, you know, are you disappointed with what we've got here, which is really just, in my view, total incompetence? I think, as the report says, Ms Cannon, as, as I said in my opening remarks, I don't think that the progress that's been made on governance and oversight of the investment or on addressing the skills gap is as good as it needs to be. Um, the problems with the framework were really that the um, lack of clarity about how you should calculate the costs and the risks of the projects that should be under its remit. Um, the new guidance addresses that, but we're yet to see its effect in, in progress. The um, staffing of the board wasn't sufficient to enable it to chase up the information that wasn't submitted on time, and the time taken to do the skills gap analysis was longer than I think it should have been. Um, the reasons for that, I think, really are best explored with the Scottish Government. But the government departments didn't even talk to each other. Yes. They couldn't get information from other departments. The board, the establishment of the board, I think, was a, a good first step, but as yeah. always, it needs to work effectively in work. practice. Yeah. The, the, um, the guidance for, the, for how the framework should be applied wasn't clear enough about which projects yeah. were in and which were out, and the staffing available to the board wasn't, wasn't enough to let it chase up the information yeah. that it needed but didn't have. Um, that, that's the finding of my report, I'm grateful I for your diplomacy. <laughs> thank you. OK, uh, can I thank the Auditor General and the team for their time this morning, uh, and just to remind colleagues that we'll be discussing this item in private later in agenda item number seven. Right. And I draw attention to agenda item number four, which is the section 22 report, uh, the 2012-13 audit of North Glasgow College. Uh, we have written submissions from the Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council uh, regarding the EGS report, entitled the 2012-13 audit of North Glasgow College. Uh, welcome colleagues, uh, comments on this. Con Beatty. There's a couple of things with this. I mean, I'm doubtful how far we as the Public Audit Committee can take this. Um, but I think there's two things. Firstly, there's reference being made to four other four other colleges mm -hmm. who have had problems. I think we need to you know, be responsible of us not to at least start asking questions about that and understanding the issues around that. I don't know how far the Auditor General's gone in terms of uh, looking into that. And obviously anything we did would have to be on the back of that. The uh, options that we've got, I think, are limited. I think, I think we should do a report on this. I don't think we should just pass it on to another committee and hope that they're going to pick it up. I think we should put a committee report with it. Uh, I mean, I'm happy if anyone else has got an idea as to what they can actually physically do over and above that. Um, I think there's been some progress made in ensuring that this won't happen again. I think the, the SFC have tightened things up. However, um, it, is, it is a concern, it is a worry, and uh, you know, I don't think we can just, as I say, close it down, pass it off and walk away. Okay, so just to clarify, there's another uh, Section 22 report that refers to the other colleges. Uh, and we are in a position to seek further information from the Auditor General on those. No. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, so that will allow further information to be sought uh, from the Auditor General on that. So just to, to let colleagues start. Uh, Shoot me now. It's <coughs> no, I agree with, uh, with Colin Beatty's comment regarding uh, putting together some type of report on this. Uh, I, will, I do welcome uh, further information coming uh, and I look forward to seeing that in due course. Uh, but uh, I mean, certainly this particular issue of the, uh, the North Glasgow College, it's, uh, it's been around now for some time uh, and been discussed in this committee for some time. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, I think it, it would be useful 
uh, for us as a committee to try to actually pull together some of the information we've received. Uh, so obviously we, 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 it's not as if we actually have uh, inquiries that run every single week on particular issues. I think it would be useful to kind of pull together, for us to pu put together a report uh, on what we actually have received, information, that the evidence that we've received as well uh, from the uh, oral sessions, uh, and uh, to then uh, possibly uh, hand it over to uh, the Education Committee, or else uh, maybe, maybe even take a, a decision uh, to maybe do some further work on it at some other point. But I think it would be useful for us to actually collate the information uh, in a report, first of all. So, right. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, obviously, being a substitute, the committee have not been about in the committee and other reports, but uh, I do think uh, the report is good, the one from the Scottish Government. I think it's fairly upfront and honest. And one of the issues which uh, I hope, when you look at the other colleges as well, you will look at is the fact that uh, sanctions were visited upon North Glasgow College, basically on the actions of the previous colleges which they inherited. I think that's quite a telling aspect of the report, that any college who is still there and inherits other colleges anything detrimental, that college with the name inherits that. And I think that's a lot of the problems which has happened in North Glasgow College. Perhaps I should declare an interest to have met with the college. It's not in my constituency anymore. Um, but I have met with the college and uh, the staff and uh, the trade unions there as well. And they are very concerned about what's happened. So anything that can be done to stop it happening in any other college would be more than welcome. And I do thank the committee for the report that they've got there. And I certainly would look at the other colleges as well that have been mentioned in this Section 22 report. Drew Smith. Uh, just to agree with the uh, colleagues, I think there's a need for, need for a, uh, a report and presumably uh, that we would publish ourselves and that... Uh, you know, presumably, considering a draft report, we'd be in a position to know uh, the you know the contents of, of uh, other reports that are coming from the Auditor General, so that could influence us as to whether or not the, the two things should be continued. You know, that that would feed into the same piece of work, or whether they are, they're entirely separate issues, and we we could publish this as a, as a standalone uh, report of the committee. Mary Scanlon. Yeah, I, th I think as Stuart McMillan said, North Glasgow has been around. Uh, the, the issues have been around for some time, but I think we should also bear in mind in the morning we're talking about skills gaps is that the money that's handed out in severance pay is money taken away from training and education, educating uh, young people. Uh, I, I'm with Colin Beattie on this. I think it's a very, very serious issue. I think it's an audit committee. You know, nobody should get away with the, the sort of lack of an audit trail uh, that they pursued. Everyone that takes from the public purse, like ourselves, uh, have to be absolutely open, accountable, and uh, all procedures must be robust uh, and emblematic of good practice. I did uh, I agree with Sandra that I thought the government response was uh, was helpful, but the government response also was mainly based on recommendations. And so, uh, whilst I can't pick fault with it, for example, not being the chair of the college and the remuneration committee, which allowed uh, the lack of an audit trail. So I think whilst it was uh, recommendations, I would like something, convener, that is a bit more robust going forward, uh, because this is not going to be the last time we'll be looking at uh, severance payments. So in that respect, and also given that we have some more colleges, some more uh, concerns raised by the Auditor General coming to us, uh, I am in favour of doing a report and ensuring that the government responds and makes sure that the correct systems are in place going forward. I just want to follow up on uh, the, the very valid point that uh, Sandra made. Um, we could, uh, and this is something to consider when we're doing the report, we could, for example, um, perhaps recommend you know, that the SFC consider sanctions against the college, but the difficulty with that is what Mary Scanlon brought up, that, this, that, that the money that was paid to the, these people came out of the pockets, if you like, of the, of the students. Exactly. Similarly, if the college is penalised, again, we're taking money out of the exactly. pockets of the students. It's a very difficult one because, obviously, I think around this table we would like to see some sort of sanctions, but if we do, we're harming the very people that we don't want to. Yeah. Okay, so... Okay, just to try and pull it together. So I think we've all agreed uh, that there will be a report. Uh, I think the scope of it is something we need to consider uh, as well. I should take on board the point Sandra made about sanctions, and the, but I think Combeating makes a really, you know, I think qualifies that uh, issue in terms of 
Actually, it wouldn't just be the students, it would be other employees who are affected, who are left. And we know there's some well-publicised examples in Glasgow uh, where, where those at the lower end of the pay scale uh, don't quite enjoy the severance arrangements that others have enjoyed. Uh, and those are the people who seem to be more affected. And that's maybe something that we can look at as the approaches it's taken with senior members of staff seem to be quite different from those uh, at the lower end of the pay scale. Uh, and you know, so I think that's something that perhaps we can we can look at at the same time uh, to make sure there's consistency in the approach that that's uh, given that there's quite substantial sums of money being spent in the merger process and severance payments. What what is the consistency when it seems to be that those who are paid much less seem to be given you know, less considered as it appears to be the case? And I think that's something that we need to look at and be given less consideration. Okay, so we'll agree to to collate a report in private at some of the future meeting. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Uh, we move to agenda item number five. Uh, we have a progress report update from the Scottish Government in relation to the committee's report on accident emergency performance update. Uh, we've already noted uh, the Scottish Government's substantive response to the committee's report. Uh, do colleagues have any, do members have any comments? Can we raise um, a couple of points, um, if I may? The first is uh, this, uh, undoubtedly from Paul Gray's answer, some useful information here, although I didn't quite understand some of it. Um, for example, on page four in the annex um, about workforce, there's a wonderful sentence which says, in the middle of the paragraph on shape of training, while providing a robust mechanism to ensure linkage across the wider UK landscape. Well, the love of me, I'm not sure I know what that means. Um, but, uh, and he doesn't say what the robust mechanism is. So it'd be quite helpful. There's just some clarity around language, which would be helpful, I'm sure. But what I really wanted to know is, are, are we due to get another report on this from Audit Scotland? This is obviously very, very topical, literally every week at the moment. Um, are they, I mean, in terms of our continuing in, in interest in this, um, will this come back at some stage through Audit Scotland work? Um, or how else is Parliament scrutinising this? Because I, I recognise a lot of this now is into another committee's responsibilities in terms of audit. Uh, sorry, in terms of policy rather than audit. So I'm informed that the Auditor General doesn't have anything planned at this stage, but I think we could, uh, we could at least should suggest to that the, to yeah. the Auditor General and seek, uh, so an seek some advice from her as to when she might want to further consider this. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other comments on that, colleagues? Con I think on the basis of uh, what's been said, that we should at this point just note the progress. Okay. Is that I, I, I think, Convener, to be fair, we were uh, planning a, a trip to Nine Wells. We thought this report raised very, very serious concerns. Uh, we took evidence from the like, NHS Grampy and Forth Valley and uh, Tayside. Tayside was an absolute beacon of good practice, and uh, we wanted to, to learn from that. It's been difficult to... To, to get that visit organised, but in actual fact, you know, Tabby Scott says uh, uh, this issue is very topical. In fact, uh, the, it's you know the the, fi the recent figures uh, for meeting the target are lower than when the NHS wrote the report. So I mean, things are actually getting worse, and I think I know there are particular issues around Glasgow with the three hospitals merging into one. I can appreciate that. But the overall figure and the overall figure across Scotland is not good. And what we did learn in evidence is this is the 24-7 open door to the NHS. And uh, we did want to look into this further. So to be honest, I don't particularly just want to note this report, I think we have an obligation. I think NHS, I mean, the, the increase in presentations to uh, to accident and emergency and all that went behind that was incredibly important to, to the National Health Service and impacted on GPs and ambulance service and all sorts of things. So I don't particularly want to note it and leave it behind because things are actually not getting better, they're getting worse. Okay. Uh, Sandra White. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, i just throw another wee uh, issue into the mix. It's on page four, um, and I do agree with Tavi Scott. I wasn't quite sure what that meant, actually, about you know, nationwide, so it would be quite good to get a clarification on that one. Um, the Scottish International Medical Training Fellowship. I would be interested to know to, if the committee could actually find out if the new immigration laws that's been put through by Westminster, which obviously, uh, you know, 
the nurses have also raised as well, the profession has raised, will this have an impact on our recruitment uh, internationally? Certainly the RCN has raised it as well. So I just wonder whether the committee could look at that particular part as well. So, can I suggest that maybe as a suggestion then to take some of those issues forward and points that Mary Scanlon's made that we maybe ask Paul Gray to come to a future session? I think that would be helpful given that we weren't able to fulfil our inquiry. That would maybe help amplify some and maybe an opportunity yes. for yeah. some of the points that Sandra Wakes raised there and put yes. that to be raised during that form meeting. Just given the... I mean, what I was trying to do with saying note the progress is really to close down this report, it doesn't mean to say that we couldn't ask the Scottish Government for figures, you know, going forward, maybe in a few months' time. Well, when, when we've got more of a... Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I think I agree with your suggestion, Kavina, that would help with Colin Beattie's point. This will be a few months' time anyway, because it's now going to be September before yeah. Paul Gray can come in front of the committee. But I think Sandra White may have raised serious questions, which, which, in the context of what we've been looking at over a period of time, would be a very good idea to ask. So I would welcome the welcome the uh, Mr Gray appearing before the committee in September. Okay. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay. Uh, before the committee moves into private session, you can just mention that there are two members of staff, uh, support staff here leaving us. Uh, firstly, Jane Williams is moving to another committee, uh, to health committee, so I'm sure we all wish Jane the very best. Uh, but Tom Williams is also leaving us from, for uh, much further field. He's going to Sweden, I understand, so I'm sure uh, the whole committee would uh, wish uh, both Jane, uh, whom we'll see in Parliament, but, but Dr Tom, who will be leaving Parliament, the very best for the future. We'll now move the committee into private session.